Greetings, urban farmers, gardeners, and healthy food visionaries. Greg Peterson here, and welcome to the 255th episode of the Urban Farm Podcast, where three days a week, we work together educating and inspiring you to become part of your food revolution. Healthy food is something everybody wants. Delicious, nutritious, and right outside your door is even better. Just text GARDEN to 44222 or go to IWANTTOGARDEN.COM and you will receive our free webinar about the seven key factors you need to know to grow your own healthy food. Today on our podcast, we have someone who advocates for knowing where your food comes from and she knows that healthy animals mean healthy food. We are talking to Gianicles Caldwell about holistic goat care. In addition to actively managing their dairy goats, Gianicles is the main cheesemaker, milker, and owner of Folia Farms, a licensed dairy located on 24 acres she grew up on in southern Oregon. Her farm is well known for its artisan aged raw milk cheese, classes on small dairy, goat husbandry, and cheese making at all levels, and its off-grid, sustainable lifestyle focus. She is the author of many books, including Holistic Goat Care, published by Chelsea Green Publishing, Mastering Basic Cheese Making, The Small Scale Cheese Business, and she often writes in photographs for Culture, The Word on Cheese magazine. Gianna Cleese and her husband Vern own and run Folia, where they are raising their daughters, Phoebe and Amelia. Welcome to the show today, Gianna Cleese. Hi there. Thanks for being here and talking all about goats. Thank you for having me. So I shared a bit about you. Can you fill in the blanks for us and share more about the path you took to get where you're at now? Sure. It's been a convoluted one, but uh, as long as all the paths led to goats, I'm happy about it. (laughs) No kidding. Yeah. We moved back to this land, which is 24 acres of the farmland I grew up on, uh, that my parents had started purchasing here in the 1940s in southern wow. Oregon. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's, it was 220 acres at that time, and my husband and I were lucky enough to come back to 24 of that, as I mentioned, and start a goat dairy. Uh, the land was free of any buildings, and so we made the choice to live off the power grid, in, which is an intentional choice in this case. Wow. We could have brought power in. Yep. Yeah, so it kind of has informed all of our lifestyle choices, uh, you know, from simple things of not having a dishwasher to uh, many other things. But running the dairy off the power grid is pretty unusual. Mm-hmm. But uh, we like to call what we have done here on this farm, Polia Farm, which we named after our daughters, by the way, Phoebe and Amelia. We like to call what we do high-tech primitive. So it's a, it's a lifestyle philosophy of approaching, approaching things at the simplest level, uh-huh. and, but with knowledge of science and some engineering and things to make it functional. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's really been a fun, fun journey. And we came back here in 2005 and got our license for the dairy in 2006, and then uh, made the cheese and the raw milk cheese that was pretty unusual at the time. Mm -hmm. There was the movement that had started in the 80s, and so with artists and cheese in the United States, or kind of revived, let's say, not so much started. And we were we're still considered towards the beginning of that, and the growth since then has just been amazing. And I'd always wanted to write books, so I had uh, always wanted to write fiction, excuse Uh me, and there was just no time for... (laughs) Yeah, right. no time for something so personal as that. I had a bunch of horses when we moved here and had to sell all of them. I used to do fine arts as a career, uh, kind of gave that up. But the need for a book on such a topic became apparent from all the calls we started getting and people wanting advice on how to do it, as well as finding out that uh, when we were in our process of this, there was no information. Right. So I thought, well, you know, if there was any way to justify trying to write a book, maybe that's the book. So the first book I wrote was on how to do a small cheese business oh. and was lucky enough to have Chelsea Green Publishing pick it up. And then I kind of got addicted to the writing process. And as I learned more about the goats, I had had dairy cows when I was growing up. Uh-huh. And, uh, consider consider myself a, a convert now to the goat side of things, the caprines. 
and I was just enthralled with them. I wanted to do a book that would focus on caring for them, but in a a fashion that most goat farmers have to do, which is almost becoming your own vet, an amateur right. vet, um, a practitioner, mm-hmm. but in a way that was as organically managed as possible. So I spent a lot of time researching, and I, I feel like with all of my books, uh, this is my fifth, that I'm I'm a good re- what I call a good regurgitator. So I can I love to look at research papers and scientific documents and try to reformat that in a way that's really understandable for somebody like me who doesn't have a degree. And that's been uh, something that evidently I'm fairly good at. This book also is filled with a lot of pictures of things that have gone wrong, and that is something that really helps folks. Oh, yeah, and exactly. Yeah, yeah, and goats, goats as a, from most standpoints, goats are very durable and sturdy critters, uh-huh. but they, like anything, have, have things that can come up with their management, yeah. and when that happens, if you're not prepared, then you have a disaster and sadness, and yeah, um, including you're... financial loss. Right, exactly. Yeah. So before we before we actually move on to the holistic goat care uh, book, I want to talk about this high tech primitive off grid life you're <laughs> living. This, yeah. This sounds fascinating. So you have no electricity, or you have solar panels with electricity. We have solar panels. We have a a very good sized system. Uh-huh. In fact. Uh, as I mentioned, how the cheese world has grown, luckily the renewable energy world has grown. But when we installed, my husband did our system. Uh-huh. When we did this system in 2005, it was the 10th largest system in the state. Wow. And now it doesn't even appear anywhere on any list because right. so many people now have photovoltaics. So we have the solar panels. We also have a very small micro hydro system which is a small water oh, power right. system yeah mm-hmm. and unfortunately our, our creek that this power is generated in only runs seasonally but on the other hand that's when the sun's not shining so oh nice well of course yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly yep and then we just designed all the buildings i was the architect for the buildings and did all the blueprints and design them to be as sustainable as possible. Every appliance is considered in that. Uh-huh. And well, it would have to be. It, yes, exactly. And that, that have to be statement is really important. I look at our power as our bank account, and we don't have a credit card. Right, if exactly. If we don't have that power, we can't spend it. Uh, of course, we do have a backup generator, which you need also just to maintain your batteries. Right. Uh, but it it is something that forces you to live differently. And I don't believe truly that being off the power grid is the right thing to do for the planet because you're not sharing any power. And we make a lot of excess during Mm -hmm. the summer that we're basically, in quotes, wasting. Right, (laughs) So it's a different way to waste electricity when you're making it and can't use it. So being on the grid would be better for the planet. We are pretty remote, so that's not as as helpful as as systems that are in closer to stations and things like that. Right. Yeah, but it's it's kind of fun. It's kind of, <laughs> it's, it's it sounds more romantic than it is as do as do most things. Like this, I, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So um, it means we can't leave the property easily. We need somebody to watch it that knows how to go how look to at the everything. voltage on the battery. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Well, you know, I think that's a that's a challenge that all of us, even here in the city. I mean, we have animals here on the property and systems here on the property that when we go out of town, we have to find a somebody that knows our systems to stay on property. For sure. And when yeah. you have animals involved, there's yep. that concern because yep. of the life. Exactly. Yeah. So, exactly. yeah, when you have a few animals, you might as well have more in a way. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So, holistic goat care. Tell us where to, where I mean, I don't even know where to start in asking a question about that. <laughs> well, it's a big book and it covers everything that has to do with the health of the goat. 
the book ha- went through several changes. When I first proposed it, it was going to be called The Complete Dairy Goat, a book all about just caring for dairy goats. Mm-hmm. But I wrote the uh, disorders section first, and that's as mm-hmm. big as some books. Right. But as I was writing it, I realized not only could I now finally understand some of these disorders by looking at them and trying to reformat the way it was ex- they were being explained, but also that it doesn't apply just to dairy goats. It applies to goats in a backyard. It applies to um, oh. meat goats and fiber goats. So then I thought, well, maybe I could make it a book all about goats. Mm-hmm. So I rewrote the first section to where I had a meat goat section, a fiber goat chapter, all pack and cart goats, because uh, those are very popular too, the, not so much cart goats, but pack right. goats, because uh-huh. they can go into most national parks and things. Oh, uh, right. But then that turned, yeah, but then that turned out to be uh, something that Chelsea Green wisely realized that that was going to be too big of a book. Mm, mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and a book has to be, it can't be so big that people can't afford to buy it. Right. Um, right. So then I rewrote the whole first section again to be <laughs> just about the health of the goat. So I do talk about meat and fiber goats, but I don't have instructions on how to butcher, as I did right. in the second derivation of that. Mm. Uh, so, yes, it's a, it's, writing a book is a, is a big struggle and process that you really have to enjoy most of that process. But it's a lot like farming in that regard. You know? mm-hmm. It's not all pretty. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So mm-hmm. first chapter of your holistic goat care book is on disease of the goats? No, no. The whole last section of the book is uh, on the diseases. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I didn't want to start with something like that. You would never want to get goats if you read that first. <laughs> <laughs> So what do I need to know? I'm I'm a never kept a goat guy. Okay. What do I need to know going into this? I have one statement for you, or one question you could ask yourself. Uh huh. If you love human toddlers, you'll love goats. Ah. Uh. They are about as challenging, entertaining, and uh, smart <laughs> uh-huh. as most human toddlers. So if you like working with them. You'll like working with goats, and no matter what the livestock has to offer your farm, whether in products and benefits, if Mm -hmm. you don't enjoy working with them, it's not going to be successful. So fortunately, I don't know how Phoenix is there, but many urban areas do now allow for small miniature size goats on the the urban farm, Mm -hmm. and that's the breed that we raise is a small breed called Nigerian Dwarfs and some, some crosses also that are considered miniature. And they, they can offer so much, but they, you do need to understand the psychology of the animal, and that is where the first chapter starts in the book, is the, the history of the goat and how they, how they became the, the first farm animal. They've been domesticated longer than any other livestock. Wow. And yeah, yeah. In fact, there was some cute, uh, not cute, but uh, a wonderful video going around about research that has, has been done into why they believe that the goat has been living with humans for so long. Mm-hmm. And it comes down to they have e- almost equal ability to recognize our facial expressions as do dogs. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty amazing, and I'm sure you can find that video if you have some spare YouTube time. Uh-huh, right. <laughs> but, uh, yes, yeah, so they are quite responsive to humans. That doesn't mean they want to do what you want them to do, mm-hmm. <laughs> a.k.a. the toddler. Right. But but there's, there's a lot to learn about them, but not so much that you can't expect to learn as you go, too. I'm, I try to... Well, I try to remain humble, but the goats make sure I stay humble. <laughs> because, yeah, because they're always teaching you something. There's yeah. always something that's going to challenge you. Uh, but that's no reason to not get started. Right. So they're, they're very, let's say, adventurous, are they not? They are, but that's just because they need stimulation and things to do. They don't. People, you always hear about how uh, fences are you know, you got to have good fences for goats. Mm-hmm. Well, you kind of do, but mostly to keep them out of things you don't want them right. in. Uh, for example, our goats are out right now in our pasture, mm-hmm. which is not fenced. 
but they're not going to leave. They're just going to stay around in the pasture and make sure that they're close enough to see the barn and get back to the barn if they need to. So it's not as though they run away. Mm -hmm. If you turn a herd of cows out in an unfenced pasture, they'll be gone. Horses will be gone. Sheep will be gone. Uh Uh, Goats are really aware of where their safety area is, and they don't want to be far from that. But if you're trying to fence them out of your rose garden, (laughs) that sort of thing, that's the challenge. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So what I hear you saying is that goats, they're kind of like chickens. They don't go very far from home. And they come back, and they come back at night. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> wow. And they do like to follow you too. You uh, with sheep and things, you can use a herding herding dog right. to help move them around. Mm-hmm. Goats follow you. So what I'll do is I'll um, let the goats out completely and take them on a hike in the forest and up in the mountain. And they can forage and browse, and they just follow me. If I start to move, they start to move. And uh, they are they like to wow. be with who they trust. Really? Yeah, it's really fun. We, we have a farm stay on Airbnb that people come stay in, ah. and going on the goat walk is pretty much their highlight. Oh, I'm sure. So recently we had Scotty on from farm stay and great yeah what an exciting thing she's doing and you're doing farm stays there tell us about it yeah so farm stay is this the term that applies to any any little sort of housing situation mm-hmm. you might have on your farm yeah. where people can come spend the spend the night uh, hang out usually some various levels of engagement with the animal right but, but a way for people to get to the country, get away from hustle and bustle. Uh, we started ours about six years ago now, I think. It's a 1970 Airstream land yacht Ooh. that we fixed up. Yeah, we fixed it up pretty cute and covered it and put a big porch on it. And it's in a fairly private spot. And we have folks come from all over the world. And it's just, it's so much fun for us. Because since we can't usually leave, this right. way we get to meet people from other yeah. parts of the world. Yeah, exactly. And some of them come just to get away from the city. Some come because they want to help learn how to milk a goat, mm-hmm. uh, go on the goat walk, uh, various various reasons that folks come. But it's it's been also a, a huge financial help to the farm. Oh, that's what I keep hearing, when, yes. Yes, yeah, yeah. And, I, and Scotty Jones has just... Her energy level, uh, what <laughs> she's amazing. done. Yes, and she, her energy level on the from the political side of it yeah. is what I would never have the endurance for. Mm-hmm. Uh, but thank goodness for her help in that regard. Yeah. Wow. How cool is that? So, if somebody yeah. wants to find out about your farm stay at your place, where do they look? Well, they can look on Farm Stay U.S. Scotty Jones site. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're also, but we do our bookings through Airbnb. Good old Airbnb. Yeah, perfect. Spell the name of your farm so if people are looking on Airbnb or on Scotty Jones's farm, they can find you. Right. Well, the name of the farm is Folia, P H O L I A mm-hmm. Farm. And on Airbnb, it's a Rogue River Eco Farm Stay. Cool. All right. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> All right. Well, we detoured there a little bit. Back to goats. Yep. <laughs> so what are goats good for on your farm? Well, on our farm, of course, they make milk mm-hmm. uh, for cheese making. And also we try to have a, a full diversity. I teach classes here, including humane slaughter and butchering. Mm-hmm. I'm going to be teaching some hide tanning, things like that. As if you do raise animals and want to have as biodiverse and sustainable a, a little farm as possible, uh, eating them is, a, is likely to be part of what you do. Yeah. I myself have been a vegetarian for almost 25 years now, but I do believe eating meat is normal, as, and it should be done with real respect for the animal's yeah. life and, of course, yeah. nurturing its life so mm-hmm. that it can nurture yours. Yeah, so uh, we do a little bit of that, not a lot, but uh, that's part of it. And uh, then there are quite a few little retired ladies running around that are just here to honor their lives Mm, and um, as sweet people. Yeah, cool. Yeah. So all of a sudden, I find myself in possession of a 
Well, we probably get them in pairs, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, with a yes. boy, right? No. <laughs> ah, okay. Yeah, so so this is where goats get their reputation, I believe, is from, from the male goat, the buck, who is quite different than the male in many other species, you mm-hmm. know, because of his scent. I, I, they smell strong. They smell musky during the breeding season in the fall. It's extremely potent. And I just like to write and remind people that find it obnoxious that they smell that way because the lady goats like it. Uh, so it is a pheromone of sorts and is part of it. But if you live on a small farm, owning a buck is not something you're probably going to do. Bucks also need to live with a companion that's also a buck. So you end up with a couple bucks if you've got a breeding farm, and mm-hmm. they need to work. They think of only one thing, and if they're not doing that a good part of the breeding season, they're going to not do well health-wise, all of that. So that does become the challenge for somebody with a very small herd of does. Does are the female goats. Mm-hmm because they need to find a buck now and then right. to breed them. Uh, there is artificial insemination, but it's not nearly as viable a possibility as it is in the cattle world, right. where you can, you know, in, the, in the cow world, you can pick a, pick a guy from a catalog and have somebody come out and take care of it for you, but <laughs> in the goats, that isn't, isn't true. But people do find a way, and then there is the other wonderful thing that isn't very well known in in that you don't need to breed them every year. You can breed them once, have them have their babies, and then milk them for years on end. Wow. As long as you keep doing it. Mm-hmm. Yep, I have a, one friend who's been milking one goat for about eight years now. <laughs> wow. Mm-hmm. So it's a, it's a great sustainable option for people who either can't access a buck or don't want to have babies to have to find new homes for. Right. Because you can't keep them all. And goats have what are called litters. They truly do have a lot of babies. We had a litter, one goat have six babies at one time. Uh Uh-huh. And then babies, litters of five are are fairly frequent on, oh a, on some farms. Yeah, so you, it's adorable because they're so cute and, <laughs> right. and fuzzy. But you have to find homes for them, so yeah. and that that becomes that's where you end up maybe eating a couple, which right. sounds a little brutal. But if you can't ensure that you're going to find a good home for them, to your best possible you know level of confidence, mm-hmm. sometimes that's the more humane thing. Yeah. Nobody wants to see the goats being passed around on Craigslist or tied oh, right. out somewhere where they're possibly going to be killed by a dog or a coyote. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. what limits, you, you currently have 70 head of goats. What? Well, then we have, just to interrupt there, Greg, mm-hmm. and I, I apologize for that misinformation, we did have 70. Uh-huh. We made a choice a very short time ago to downsize and uh, cut back on some of that. Mm. Uh, mm-hmm, our daughters kind of grew up and moved away. They're uh, 31 and 24 now, and got it. they had been a big part of it. Um, without that sort of family help and inspiration to keep going, I mm-hmm. kind of wanted to, to back off a little bit and just be able to enjoy them, that's keep what, milking, yeah, keep that's teaching. What, that's what I was going to ask you is what 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 is your size limiter for your you know, your herd of goats. Right. Well, that was the size limit as far as what we could manage and uh, uh, on the land of this size. Mm-hmm. But uh, now it's, it's downsized a lot, and I need more goats almost right now. <laughs> but it, well, it's going to be more sustainable labor-wise. Yes. And baby management. Uh, two years ago, uh, during kidding season, we had 124 babies born. Oh, my gosh. And that... Yes, it's quite the challenge in the spring to make it through sanely and keep those all those babies healthy. And this year we only have only had fifteen, so you can imagine the difference in yes. pressure and uh, enjoyment. My husband and I are both in our mid to approaching. I'm tipping over that scale up past the mid fifties into the next section here. Uh-huh, right, <laughs> and we. Yeah, and we want to be able to enjoy this property yeah. more than more than just have it be our workplace. 
Right. We both, we have another business we started, and then I did not realize when we started that I was going to want to keep writing books. Oh, um, right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a kind of can't do everything at <laughs> once in life, and you certainly can't do everything at once well. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> So, you know, sitting here again with no goat experience at all, uh, what are the top three things I need to know about keeping goats? The first thing that's good to know about keeping goats is that they are herd animals, meaning they they need to live with others of their own kind. Mm -hmm. They can be a companion. You could have a single goat as a companion to a horse, and they do okay, uh, or a cow but they prefer to live with their own kind. So you can't just get one goat, much like eating a certain brand of potato chips. Mm -hmm. You can't have just one. The second thing to know is that they don't like to be wet, so they don't Mm. like rain. Right. And this, yeah, this, this definitely affects your housing opportunities. So if you're going to have goats and you don't have good shelter and you live in a very wet area, you're going to have troubles both psychologically with the animals and also Mm health-wise. And then the next thing to know about them is that they are fairly easy to care for, but because in nature they would range wide and far and eat plants that cows and sheep don't care for, namely they like trees and shrubs, that means that their diet, when we provide a diet in confinement, you have to think of some things that um, you wouldn't with a cow or a sheep. Right. Uh, yeah, so they it's believed that goats have a higher mineral requirement than any other livestock because trees and shrubs put the roots deeper into the earth and bring up these minerals. Ah, very good. Yeah, so so you need to address their mineral needs and um, that's I I touch a lot on nutrition in the book because it really is Other than genetics and environment, nutrition is the secret to health, and that's true for us, too. Right. But understanding a little bit about their nutrition. So your three things all involve psychology and the the goat's innate needs, but they're they're fairly simple to address if you just put a little thought into Um, them. And I'll bet you cover this all in your book. Indeed, I believe I have. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) That book is Holistic Goat Care, published by Chelsea Green. So I'm going to shift on you, and I'd like for you to talk about a time you failed, how you overcame that failure, and what you might have learned from it. Boy, well, there are so many times. (laughs) (laughs) It's, It's truly hard to pin one down. I've had failures where it's involving just not knowing enough at the time or where I wasn't aware of something, didn't pay close enough attention. Mm -hmm. And they're just, they happen, they're going to continue to happen. And it's, I really can't come up with a good one without crying, probably, because Mm -hmm. it usually involves the loss of an animal's life. Right. um, From something I didn't notice in time. Many times it's been when I've been traveling for the books. And I come back, and I'm the one that pays the closest attention to the animals right. and can read them the best. And I know I don't know if that's a failure or not, because in some ways it's unavoidable unless I'm just going to stay here all the time. Yeah. So, I, yeah, they, every, every failure, I guess, you know, that's, it's a, a reminder that you're trying to do things and moving forward getting over them to the point where you learn, but don't forget, but Mm -hmm. don't drive yourself crazy with guilt (laughs) is the secret. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I I noticed Heidi, uh, Heidi and I keep hens here at the urban farm and really Heidi is the hen keeper. And Uh, she, she notices things that, you know, I would just not know to notice. And You know, so all of a sudden, here a couple of weeks ago, there's a chicken living in our, in our bathtub, and that happens. <laughs> that happens once a month or once every three months, whenever there's a hen that's not doing so well. And right. Heidi's masterful, first of all, at paying attention and noticing what's going on with the animals, and then, you know, figuring out what to do about it. Right. You know. Right, so I, and so you can't. She probably puts more pressure on herself too because she knows she can tell. Um, yeah. So, it, yeah, these sorts of things are all about degrees of experience, and mm-hmm. yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So what do you consider your biggest success? Probably surviving the failures. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, biggest success, though, truly, I mean, it's just is going forward, uh, knowing that you're going to learn more, taking things to heart, but like I said, not to the point that they stop you. Mm-hmm. I'm awfully proud that we were able to, to excuse me, I cry really easily, <laughs> to get right. our daughters here while they were still young enough yeah. to learn some of these things. Our youngest daughter has the most balanced perspective of life and death that I've ever seen in mm. a human, mm-hmm. and she's able was able to, like, if I didn't even want to get up and take care of a sick kid, she I'd get up in the morning, she'd have it sleeping by her bed, kind of <laughs> like the bathtub and the hen. But then, on the other hand, I caught her up here one day with the binoculars looking out the window. Uh, we have an upstairs loft in the barn where our kitchen is. Right. She was looking out the window with the binoculars up at the upper pasture where we had a dairy cow and a steer. And I said, what are you doing? What's going on? Because we use the binoculars to look for problems, uh, you know, see if somebody's being harassed by a, a, an animal or something. And she said, nothing, nothing's wrong. I said, well, what are you doing? She said, I'm looking at the steer. I'm picking out the parts I want. <laughs> oh. <laughs> she, it's like Wiley E. Coyote looking at the steak, you know, the roadrunner as a roast. And so it just an ability to cherish life and an ability yeah. to in t- take it in at all levels. So I'm I'm very proud of that. Nice. So what drives you? Well, for some strange reason, I've always had, or at least since I was about 18, a deep sense of mortality and it, and perhaps it was my interaction with my cows and life mm-hmm. and death then mm-hmm. I've always felt like life is really short. I remember bizarrely thinking at 18 that I better start working out because pretty soon it'd be too late, you know. Right. <laughs> I'd be too too old and not to, and I, and even now I feel like you know what really we have about 3 maybe 4 really good decades in our life. Yep. To work. Exactly. Yeah. Our 20s might be wasted because you're either in school, you're still being treated like a child by most adults, whatever, and then you're physically and mentally at your peak for a very brief time, mm-hmm. and 10 years goes so fast. So it's it's made, and my husband feels the same way too, we aren't afraid to make a change, to try something new, to dive in full force, yeah. because if you wait, you won't maybe ever do any of those things. Right. And it just, it's life, and a day is short. Everything's so short. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so just feel like, just do the best and get going. Yeah, and I, I've noticed that I'm I'm 56 years old, and I've noticed that. Oh, it, you're the same age. Yeah. yeah, you know, it, yeah. It, it, it goes faster the older you get. Yeah, and I think it's, our, it's that increasing awareness of mm-hmm. that, and of course perspective, too, on time. But right. I, I remember my... 85 year old grandmother telling me that even for her time kept going faster even yeah. though the days were longer and it just yeah you know. yeah don't wait get out there and do what you love to do make your heart happy right yes I, well and sometimes though I, I think that's you may not know what that is but mm-hmm. you just have to be do something be busy do yeah. something and those other things you'll figure them out and not being afraid to take some risk too yeah so and that's what i tell people all the time and that's that you know you just got to go out and try something and yep, yep. you know i had more jobs in my 20s than most people have in their lives <laughs> I, I, I did a like job our daughters yeah i did a job for 2 hours once and it's like yeah <laughs> i don't think so but when I got done with that job, it's like, okay, I don't need to go back there. Now I know. Right. 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 Yeah, you learn something. Yeah, exactly. Now I love what I do, and it sounds like you do too. Yep, for sure. Perfect. So, is there a book that's been influential for you in this process in your life? Uh, well, there are I, the books. There are so many, and I was thinking about since I did know this question ahead of time, the kind of goes back for what led to this life anyway to one that almost every woman goat farmer and every woman cheesemaker identifies with and that's Heidi because there's just this connection in that book Mm. to 
something pure and simple of the cheese, the bread, and the animal. And if you now for me, if you throw in the wine with that, then <laughs> yeah. I'm I'm good. And then uh, another book that was or series was All Creatures Great and Small by oh, the vet yes. James Harriet, mm-hmm. and that just made me want to know the science part of it and uh, understand the workings of the creature mm-hmm. and try to troubleshoot. And I did become a nurse for six years, I think probably as a consequence of that too. And then that's helped, of course, support this knowledge now. Yeah. Wow, perfect. So what one final piece of advice do you have for our listeners? Well, when it comes to probably all these things in goats, is, and this ties back to what we were just talking about, is don't, don't expect to learn everything to go forward. Uh, don't try to have everything perfect before you give some of these things a, a try. Mm-hmm. Uh, do some basic research, but then just expect to have the whole process be a journey of learning and uh, just keep learning. <laughs> Amen to keep learning. I am a mm-hmm. big, big <laughs> proponent of that. Yeah, so. and thank you for your contribution to yeah, that. You bet. You bet. Well, thank you so much for joining us on the show today, Gianna Cleese. It's been a treat getting to chat with you. And we are excited to say that you're going to be coming back to our show in a few weeks to talk about cheese making. Yay. Well, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Greg. Absolutely. And in the meantime, how can our listeners get a hold of you? I have our farm's website, which is foliafarm.com, P-H-O-L-I-A farm, Mm -hmm. just one of them, dot com. And then my own website, GianaCleaseCaldwell.com. And there are various ways to contact me through those. And then I also have uh, both of those have a Facebook page. Perfect. And you can find show notes from today's podcast at urbanfarm.org slash goat care. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for joining us on the Urban Farm Podcast. Do you want to save money at the grocery store, eat more organic, whole foods, cultivate food security, and feel more connected to the earth? If so, then growing your own food is a no-brainer. You wouldn't believe how many people come to me claiming that they can't grow their own food. They think they don't have enough space, that they're too busy, or that they simply don't have what it takes. Perhaps you've fallen for one of these gardening myths. If you think you can't grow food, or if you think the only food that you have access to is what you buy in the grocery store, I have a life-changing webinar that you need to see. It's free and will help you unearth your inner gardener. I've helped thousands of people just like you learn to grow their own food, and I'm speaking from my own experience when I say that with the right knowledge in place, there is no such thing as a black thumb. With this webinar, you can begin making your garden dreams come true and start growing delicious, nutritious food for your family. Just text GARDEN to 44222 or go to IWantToGarden.com and you will receive our free webinar about the seven key factors you need to know to grow your own food. Remember, that's GARDEN to 44222 or IWantToGarden.com. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Urban Farm Podcast. Remember to listen three days a week for tips, advice, and resources to help you on your journey with urban farming. You can find us on the web at urbanfarm.org or send us an email to podcast at urbanfarm.org. In the words of Vincent Van Gogh, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Be encouraged that with each lesson learned and skill developed, you are one step closer in the direction of your dreams.